Uh, I have some numbers coming in. We are at more than 33 million cases as of now in the country, with at least 591,000 deaths. Uh, in the world, we're at 168 million, with at least 3.49 million deaths. My question to you is, we keep on hearing that globally and in the United States, the cases are going down, and so are the death numbers. But these numbers are so large. So how are you sort of observing it, and how, how should we sort of analyze this? The numbers are large, but you know the 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 nice thing is the worst is behind us. Um, right now, you know, just as a practicing physician, we see that cases are down fifty percent from last month and twenty percent down from last week. Right now, we're admitting five times less in the hospital uh, the number of patients that we were a couple months ago. So, you know, just from a healthcare standpoint, things have really drastically changed. And in terms of the magnitude of the numbers, look, we've lost a lot of people to COVID. And, uh, you know, exactly a year ago, uh, the New York Times published a list of a thousand names on their front page of all the people who died. And, and we always remember the, those who passed on and the families that, that don't have their loved ones. The magnitude is something that we're going to live with for the rest of our lives. But the nice thing is uh, COVID, uh, it looks like we've turned the corner. It is behind us. The rate that we're vaccinating is really leading this effort. Right. But, you know, as we talk, Dr. Asia, the world here is opening up. Uh, New York has opened up. New Jersey has opened up. Connecticut has opened up. Several other states are also falling through the same. My question to you is, we only have half the U.S. adult population vaccinated. We don't even have the children vaccinated yet. Do you think it's a little too early to start opening up everything? And also, I have to get your comments on the new mask guidelines by the CDC, which basically tell you to shed your mask if you're fully vaccinated. How are you looking at all of this? Is it too early? Um, that's a good question. So first, let's start with the CDC guidelines. Right. Um, so right now, as we know, the CDC says that if you're fully vaccinated, meaning two weeks out from your last vaccine dose, you don't need a mask, whether it's indoors or outdoors or around vaccinated or unvaccinated people. Um, and as a healthcare professional and a person who looked at the science and the data, they are extremely accurate and right on in their recommendations. Um, so their data is based off of uh, an Israeli population with a mass vaccination protocol. And it's also based off of the healthcare providers in the United States who got vaccinations early. And what they saw was that the risk of getting COVID once you're vaccinated is extremely rare. The risk of getting infected, meaning you can get COVID but not be infected, the risk of getting infected is really rare. And the risk of transmission of giving it to a person is really, really rare once you're fully vaccinated. So based on those recommendations and based on hard science, they said, hey, um, we don't actually uh, we don't need masks. And that's what the science points to. Now, with that said, I understand that the science points to it, but it's causing a lot of fear. Um, change is extremely hard, especially in light of the fact that we saw so many people die in the United States around the world. So I know people are going to have a tough time with it. But I do want to reinforce that what the CDC also says is that if you are unvaccinated, your risk of getting COVID, your risk of dying from COVID or getting sick from COVID is high. So you still need to put those masks and you still need to socially distance and, and be careful. Now, in terms of lifting restrictions, um, back to your first question, the United States, um, obviously, you know, in New York City and around the U.S., all, all the state governments are releasing uh, are, uh, uh, disposing of their mask mandates. Um, all the stores like, you know, Target and, and Best Buy and Trader Joe's, right now you can go in and grocery shop without a mask. And according to the science, according to the hard data, if you're fully vaccinated, again, the risk of getting it and transmitting it are so low that it makes sense. Right, but my question to you uh, now is about these unvaccinated individuals that refuse to get the vaccine, and there are a couple millions of them here in this country. Yeah. Could that, like, pose a threat on what's happening with the decline of case numbers in cases and also in deaths. Uh, are you worried at all about what will happen if none of these unvaccinated people, you know, get vaccinated and they're going around maskless because, you know, nobody has to wear a mask now? Yeah, that's, you know, you're, you're right on in that point. And that's such a great question, simply because 
right now we have no way to verify who is vaccinated and who is unvaccinated. So when the CDC did issue their recommendations, it was based on science, but there's a gray area because, you know, it, it goes by an honesty protocol. You have to be honest. If you're vaccinated, you have to, you don't have to wear a mask, but if you're unvaccinated, you have to. And unfortunately right now, there's no way to verify, um, you know, except like vaccine cards and stuff, but people aren't really checking that. So you're right. Um, if if somebody's unvaccinated and they don't have a mask, they have a high risk of getting COVID and a high risk of transmitting it to other unvaccinated people. And that in turn carries a higher risk of, of uh, creating mutations that can then go around and then, then create things that can surpass, create variations and mutants that could surpass what our current COVID vaccine actually covers and thus creating a whole new crisis. But I don't wanna be alarmist because I don't suspect that an overwhelming majority will be dishonest about it. And at the rate that we're vaccinating right now, the United States vaccinated 50% of the entire population which is more than the rest of the world, which is a huge number. And, you know, at the rate that we're vaccinating, I think we'll be okay. Do you think we will reach herd immunity, especially with this new news that we are hearing? Moderna says uh, it's safe for children aged 12 to 15. Do you think adding the children into getting vaccinated will take us there? Or how are you feeling about herd immunity? Uh, so the definition of herd immunity, um, Right. So the definition of herd immunity is if enough people get vaccinated, then that should cover the unvaccinated people. So, you know, the thing about COVID is it's it's new. We don't know what the herd immunity number is. There's some models that actually say all you need to do is vaccinate 50 percent of people and then you'll achieve herd immunity. But then there's some models that say you need a higher number, like 70 percent. Now, so we don't know what the exact number is or even if there is a herd immunity with COVID. But what I can say for a fact is that if you're vaccinated, vaccinating children, um, the more people that you vaccinate, the safer our society and our world will be. Yes, for sure. And then talking about these children, doctor, it brings me to another million dollar question, which is about school reopenings. A New York City uh, mayor actually gave a statement saying he's going to open up schools in the fall. Uh, no remote option. We're hearing the same from New Jersey and other states as well. Now, my question is, is it safe to open schools when we do not know if the kids will be fully vaccinated or not? Uh, that, that's, that's a hard question and that's a good question. Um, New York City is the largest um, school district, city school district that exists. So it does set an example for the rest of the country. And if kids are not fully vaccinated, they can still potentially be vectors to spread COVID. So the answer, that's another gray area. Um, the answer for school reopening, if we don't know that the kids are fully vaccinated, if they can transmit COVID, yeah, it's, it's definitely impossible. Right. And do you think the schools should perhaps require a vaccination from all the students to safely open it? Yes, um, I do. Uh, but the, the, the issue is we need to do studies to make sure that it's OK in certain age groups before we actually vaccinate those kids. The positive and the nice thing is um, these pharma companies are actually testing in these groups and even, you know, babies and infants now so fast yeah. that I expect that we're going to have that data, you know, well before school reopening time. Right. And do you think this vaccine, these vaccines could be safe enough for children from age 2 to 12? I know trials have started in it. How are you feeling about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the rate that the vaccines are showing efficacy for kids um, right now, 100 percent, you know, effect, efficacy and and minimal adverse effects. Uh, look, you know, I want to talk about uh, I'm sure some of your viewers know about MISC, right? It's a it's a large inflammatory disorder that basically targets every single organ in your body that happens in kids after you get COVID. And we saw so many kids with this, you know, multi-inflammatory disorder. Right. That's the risk of what happens when you get COVID when you're a child. So vac vaccination in kids and cru is crucial, not just for school reopening and education, but so that we can save kids' lives. Right. Um, so yeah, so I suspect that the data will extend towards all age groups, and I think those age groups should get vaccinated if it shows that it's safe, which I suspect it will. And what do you have to say to parents that may be worried about the development of their child in these adolescents age group or even the younger ones? You know, we're seeing some parents be hesitant towards the vaccine for the children. They may themselves be vaccinated. Uh, what do you say to them? I, I don't have kids. Um, so I, 
but I sympathize. Um, you're putting a new, you know, uh, a medication, if you will, into the body of your child, and you care about your child so much, and and you know, there's so much that you don't know. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that the science is the science. Um, you can't argue against it, and the studies that they do are so meticulous, it's so rigorous, and they do it across large populations um, with complex statistical analysis that shows if it's going to work and if it's going to cause any adverse effects. And you know, I can I can tell you that there's no funny business with the science. Um, when they say that it's safe in kids, it's safe in kids. Now. Um, you know, I've been asked so many times, what about in the future? How do we know, you know, it's not going to cause things, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now? That's a great area. We don't know because we don't have that data. We're going to have to keep track of it. But right now, the data shows that it's saving kids. This brings me to um, another question that experts have actually raised concern over, doctor, which is the fact that if you look at last year, summer was good. It was okay where the cases got controlled. Um, and then when the fall happened, you saw another emergence of cases and another wave. Are you worried that the same thing could happen right now? Because it's looking like while we go into summer, everything is getting controlled, but we do not know what's going to happen in the fall. Uh I'm, I'm not worried because the difference between last summer and this summer is we have vaccines and we're vaccinating in such a rapid pace. If we didn't have that, I would a thousand percent be worried. You know, when vaccines, uh, before the vaccines came out, people were saying maybe it's going to be three years from now, four years from now. We, we don't really know. And so nobody has suspected that we would have vaccines this quickly and, and that work this well, but we do. So I'm not worried about this summer. Right. And what is your recommendation for the upcoming Memorial Day weekend? Uh, so my recommendation is uh, in line with the CDC's recommendation. So if you're traveling anywhere, if you're getting on a plane, if you're you know um, going to visit somebody in a hospital, wear your mask even if you're fully vaccinated. Um, and if you're unvaccinated, socially distance, six feet apart, wear your mask. But the restrictions are a lot lighter right now for fully vaccinated people. So. Uh, if everybody, you know, if, if the people around you are fully vaccinated, the risk is minimal to you. But just remember that if there's somebody in your group that's unvaccinated or is lying about being vaccinated, they're posing a risk to them by being around you. Right. So the big part is to get your vaccine. So, so, so important. Let's now talk about India real quick. Dr. Wise will have you here on ITV Gold with us. Um, the, the outbreak um, has been tragic. The news that we get from India has been tragic. The shots of crematories, it's, it's heartbreaking. How are you looking at the case numbers and death numbers there in India right now? And some are saying that the cases are now getting under control. Uh, do you agree with that? Thank you so much for that question. Um, we hear certain figures coming out of India. So right now we hear, um, you know, 300,000 deaths. But actual models actually show that it's likely 4 million deaths. Right. Um, we hear that there's a certain amount of infections, like 300,000 infections, but actual uh, actual or sorry, uh, 26 million infections. But actual models show that infection rates are about 700 million. So we don't know what's actually happening and we don't know uh, how transmissible certain variants are. We just know that they're of concern. Now, with that said, the seven day average right now in India is less than it was in the week before. Does that mean that uh, we're over the second wave? No, because we know that it's spreading into rural areas. We know that it's spreading into places like West Bengal and in Southern India. We know that it's spreading into Nepal. We know that it's spreading into Thailand. So all of this means that the region itself is still at risk. And, and we also know that people aren't, when people get admitted to hospitals, sometimes they're dying of COVID, but Oftentimes, you know, on their death certificate, it says things like pneumonia or kidney failure. So we don't know the real numbers. So I would still be enormously cautious. I would not drop any guard. Um, if you're living in India, if you have family members in India, I would tell them, please tell them to be careful. It is not slowing down. It is still among the highest amount of infections and deaths in the world. So they need to be careful. And if they don't do enough, they could set the stage for a third wave. Right. And we're hearing that India is in its peak right now. It's still dealing with the peak of COVID-19. What is your prediction for the next couple of weeks for India? 
you know, COVID acts in a certain way where the worst is sometimes four to six weeks after you get an infection. So the next couple of weeks are really gonna uh, are really gonna tell us um, just how dangerous it is, and I suspect that things might even get worse um, in certain regions of India. So the cities will get uh, better because of lockdown measures that have been imposed, but a lot of the rural areas and countries surrounding it will get worse. Um, you know, let's remember there is the Indian variant, which is a World Health Organization variant of concern, highly transmissible, highly lethal. So I would be uh, very concerned over the next few weeks, very cautious. And I would also, uh, I would also like to point out that a lot of the things that India did in the beginning of, you know, in the last couple of months to cause this pandemic, meaning large political gatherings, large religious festivals, um, a lot of people dropping their guard. If, if, we, if we start to do that again, and, you know, there are already large reports that, that the Indian government and a lot of the Indian public are engaging in these same political rallies, same religious festivals. If we start to do that again, then the next few weeks are, are gonna be horrible. It's just gonna be another resurgence. Right. Where do you think the healthcare system is lacking the most there? Uh, in, I think the healthcare system is lacking in so many ways. Um, India completely dropped its guard um, in the last few months leading up to it, which causes pandemic. So they did not build up their hospital infrastructure. Um, they did not uh, impose any public health safety measures for in terms of masks, in terms of um, social distancing. They dropped that all. They uh, did not uh, get enough medications and they did not um, prepare in case there was a pandemic. And they knew that the world was suffering from a pandemic, but for some reason, the health minister went on air and said, hey, COVID's over. We can do whatever we want. We can have religious festivals. We can have political rallies. So I think that that that's where it lacked. And then on top of that, India is the largest vaccine manufacturer in right. the world. It makes AstraZeneca. But then without any of their population vaccinated, they just they gave out their vaccines to the rest of the world. So, you know, call it greed, call it corruption, call it. it horrible public health measures, call it blatant disregard for the general public of, of India, call it nationalism, call it, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Modi had to get elected, call it like political ambition, whatever you want to call it. Um, they dropped the ball on pretty much all facets of society. So right now they have to build it back up um, to prevent another wave. Right. How are you looking at these black fungus cases that are happening in India with COVID? Um, you know, I've personally treated a lot of uh, mucormycosis. So black fungus is a disease that happens when your immune system is suppressed, um, which is what happens when you're treating COVID. Um, so there are thousands, if not more, of this black fungus case in India, and it, it impairs your eyes, it impairs your heart, the, the mortality rate is 50%, meaning, you know, half of people with it die. And you need a really expensive medication called amphotericin. Um, to treat it. So it's a deadly, horrible disease. I wouldn't wish on anybody. The patients that I had, almost all of them died. Um, there's, there's, there's not much that you can do except hope for the best. And sometimes you need complex surgical operations that India doesn't really have. So it's an unfortunate byproduct of this whole COVID uh, thing happening. Now, the one bright side is that it's not uh, transmissible. You can't give it to somebody else. You know, my final question to you has to be, when you're looking at these lockdown measures and, you know, hopefully these are working in India because then people are literally not going out. Besides that, do you think vaccination is the answer to get out of uh, this uh, intense wave of COVID-19 cases and deaths? How does India actually truly control it? I'm happy you asked that. Um, vaccinations is the long-term answer. Hmm. Um, so right now, only about 3% of uh, India is vaccinated. And if you start to get vaccines on the ground into rural areas, that's gonna take months and months to actually get this herd immunity that's needed in such a large country. You need to vaccinate almost 800, 900 million people to really actually uh, have an effective uh, immunity from vaccines there. 
So that is the long-term answer. The short-term answer is we need to build up their healthcare infrastructure and we need to build up their arsenal. We need to get oxygen supplies there and we need to get medicines there. We need to get steroids there. We need to get hospital beds there. We need to uh, have uh, safe places for people to go and quarantine. We need to get people to be able to survive a lockdown, meaning uh, you know, economically, they're they're really restricted and they suffer, and a lot of them descend further into poverty. You need to have the government give them very similar stim stimulus checks that we had here, so that they can survive, so they're not forced to go out and go back to work. So these public health measures are really the only way to uh, to to help this population. So right now, it's like you know, when a patient is coding. You need to save the patient right there. So we need to get the supplies right now, today, right there. Vaccines are only going to be effective for you know across many months and across you know even years. It's not the solution for now. So we need to work on that, but we need to work on a couple other things first. Yes, definitely. And sending that help back to India is so important. I know a lot of Indian organizations, even here in the United States, and hospitals are trying to do that. It was really great having you on ITV Go with us. Thank you so much for your time today.